Good morning, Discovery Church. So glad that you're here today in the worship service. We've been in a series here at Discovery for the last few weeks on the king and his kingdom, and we're glad that you could join us. I brought a few of my friends on the back row. I'd like to have you guys stand, if you would, in the back, those that have come to be part of the service. Go right ahead. Are you glad that they're here today? I would certainly <laughs> welcome them. Thank you for coming, guys. We're so glad that you're here with us in the service today. We are online, so uh, welcome to those watching online. My wife told me in the beginning of the service that I to look over here because I was looking over here in the other service. So I'm going to look everywhere possible, but there is a camera. We'll be taking note of that as well. And we're glad that you're here today in the church service, and we serve a great God. Amen. I haven't preached in three months, so I'm going to need your help a little bit. So if I say something good, I want you to say amen. If I say something bad, I want you to say, oh, me. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to need your help. So we're going to practice this, all right? Uh, in the history of all of history, there's only one man in the world who was the greatest man that ever lived, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. There we go. Hey, man, we're glad that you're with us today. We are in the Gospel of Matthew in the third chapter, so if you have your Bibles, you can tune to that and turn to that, and if not, you can scan your electronic device to the QR code in the back of the seat, and it'll pop up on your electronic device, but we're going to be talking today about the king and his kingdom, and this is the ministry of John the Baptist as he comes onto the scene after 29 years at the end of the second chapter when the wise men came. It would be 29 years later that John the Baptist would appear on the scenes. Let me set the groundwork for this particular narrative. The Jews for centuries have been under oppression they were ruled and governed by pagan nations starting from the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire to the Grecian Empire all the way down to the Roman Empire in which Jesus lived and John the Baptist was preaching in that day. It is a time known in the scriptures as the times of the Gentiles when the Gentiles, the people of the other nations ruled and governed Israel is a nation, and they long waited for the Messiah to come, according to the Old Testament prophets, and deliver them and establish a kingdom on the earth. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, and he was about ready to march on the scene in John chapter 3 and be baptized by this great man we know as John the Baptizer, and he would, Jesus would start his public ministry. But let me just give you a preview first of all. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew goes to great lengths to document the, what is known as the genealogies of Jesus Christ. He documents the historical fact that Jesus was in the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, going all the way down to King David, all the way to his parents, Joseph and Mary, and that Jesus was in the bloodline as the Messiah to have the right to rule and to reign as the king. Chapter 2, the wise men march on the scene, heralding that Jesus was the king of the Jews. And he goes into the, the Magi, march into Jerusalem, and they want to know where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So the Magi present the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, declaring that Jesus Christ through all of their wisdom and through all of their knowledge of astrology and ma magicians and sorcery, they knew that this was the king that was to come. And in John chapter 3, John the Baptist is in the wilderness of Judea, baptizing people for the remission of sins, 
getting them ready and prepared for the coming of the Messiah. So I'd like to pick up in Matthew chapter 3, and we'll look at the first five verses. If you have your Bible, you can turn to it. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. The people from Jerusalem and Judea and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This was a great movement of God as John is baptizing people out in the desert, away from the religious establishment. Out in the middle of nowhere is this itinerary preacher preaching the message of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's at hand. It's near. It's the next imminent thing that's going to take place in the historical books of history. So John is baptizing, and many from Dan to Beersheba came to be baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. In order for us to talk about this great prophet of God, we need to go back a little bit and look at his mother and father, Zacharias and Elizabeth, who were elderly. They were old. They, Elizabeth was past the, the time of bearing children, and God was going to do a miracle in their life and give them a son in their old age. And look with me in in Luke chapter 1 and verse 13, the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, because your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John, and there will be joy and delight for you. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and will never drink wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, the prophet their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous and to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. The name John means Jehovah graciously gave. And that's exactly what happened. Jehovah was going to graciously give them a child in their old age. Jehovah graciously gave. And Jehovah graciously gave to us this man of God who would announce the coming of the Messiah. It was a gift from God. John was a gift from God. John 1, 6 says, that there was a man sent from God whose name is John. Jehovah graciously gave. Now Malachi prophesied of the coming of the Messiah and the coming of John the Baptist, should I say, in Malachi 3.1. He says this in Malachi 3.1, See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come into his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. And the Jewish people knew about these prophecies. They knew that John the Baptist would come in the spirit and he would be the messenger that would come before the Messiah. And this is a great verse, and you want to take note of this if you're a student of the Bible. Malachi 4, 5 says this. Look, I am coming to send you a prophet, the prophet Elijah, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. You see, the Jews knew that in order for the Messiah to come, that 
this messenger had to come first, that Elijah would come first. You recall that Elijah never tasted death. He got in that chariot one day, and he rode right into heaven. He never saw death. And the, the Jewish people were waiting for Elijah to appear first. And they knew that when Elijah appeared, the Messiah would follow after. So here they're waiting for Elijah to appear. And John the Baptist comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea, baptizing people for the remission of sins, turning them to the king. At the Jews' Passover, at every Passover, they pour a cup of wine called the fifth cup. And this cup, they set aside on the table and they do not drink it. They pour it for Elijah because they're waiting for Elijah one day to come through the doors and take the cup. And when Elijah comes and drinks of the cup, then the Messiah would come and deliver them from the oppression of the Gentile nations that had ruled over them for centuries. They were waiting for deliverance. They wanted to be delivered from Roman oppression. They were waiting for the king to come and to set up the kingdom, but the kingdom was not that kind of kingdom. I recall when Jesus was interviewed by Pilate, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? He says, you say that I am a king. He told them that my kingdom was not of this world. That Jesus was going to set up a kingdom into the lives of believers. That this sphere of God's kingdom would come to you and to me. And that we would be the children of the most high God. And that God was going to establish his kingdom first in the church and in us. Matthew eleven eleven. 11, there's a great portion of scripture. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And Jesus said, if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. Matthew 17, 10, at the Mount of Transfiguration, you recall that Jesus appeared and was glorified and was transfigured before James and John and Peter. And Moses appears and Elijah appears. And Peter so brilliantly says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles or three tents. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. You recall the story. And out of the thunder of God's voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him and him alone. And the disciples fell on their face. So as they're coming down from the mountain, look with me in Matthew 17, 10. Then the disciples asked him, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah is coming and I'll, he will restore everything, replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and did, you did not recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of John the Baptist. You see, when John was in the river out in Judea baptizing the multitudes that were there, everybody was trying to figure out who is he? Who is this man? Who is this man that has the authority and preaches with the authority of God? To tell people to repent of their sins. And we are indebted to John 
in his gospel because we see that in John 1.19, it says this. This was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? He didn't deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. What then, they asked, are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet Moses? He answered, no. Who are you, they asked him, and we need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? You see, when they were going out to John the Baptist, they were all trying to figure out who he was. And the religious leaders sent out priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? And he says, they asked him, are you the Messiah? And he says, no. They said, are you Elijah? He says, no. He says, are you uh, Moses, that prophet? He says, no, I am the voice of one crying in the, in the wilderness. Make straight the path for the Lord. The Lord is coming. I am the one who is sent by God to announce that the king is coming. The king was coming. He's at hand. He's near. It is the next thing that is to come. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful portion of Scripture. That is the theological implication to this portion right here. Now, let's put this in practical terms where we live, okay? John had some things to say in his message. He said a lot of things, but I want to give you a couple things he said. The first thing he said was get ready. Get ready because the king is coming. That was the message John proclaimed. And he said, make straight the path of the Lord. Prepare the way. And in that particular time in history, when a king was going to travel to another city, they fixed the roads. They moved any obstacles that was out of the way. They sent ambassadors out to let the people know that the king is coming. They would repair the roads. They would make straight the paths. And that's the implication here. John the Baptist is saying, look, the king is coming. Get Ready, make straight the path for the Lord and prepare his coming. Basically, what he was really saying was this. Get your heart ready. Prepare your heart. The king is coming. John was saying that the time is at hand, that, that the king is coming. Get ready. Get your heart ready. Confess your sins. Get your life right. Be ready when the king comes. And that's true today. We need to be ready when the king comes. He's coming back again. Amen. He came the first time. He's going to come again the second time. Luke 3 in verse 12 and following. We have a great uh, help here concerning uh, the people that were there, John said, get ready, but he also said, get right. Get right. Get your life together. And if you want to know who's there, Luke 3.10 says this, what then shall we do? The crowds asked John. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. The one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. You know who was at the baptism of John? Multitudes, Jews, tax collectors, Roman soldiers, people came from all over to hear this man out in the middle of the wilderness. I have to pay people to come hear me preach, but people were flocking to John because he spoke the word of God and they were hungry and they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. 
And Judd told him, do the right thing. If you're a tax collector, don't take what more than you're supposed to. Don't put a, an extra tax on, tax on top of the tax that they've already been taxed. And if you're a Roman soldier, rule with integrity and don't use your authority to bully them. Do the right thing and be content with what they're paying you. Get your heart right. That was the message John the Baptist was preaching. This is a recorded, of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm wondering if Matthew was there to be baptized by John. Matthew was a tax collector, and, John, and Matthew could have been right there in the crowd, and perhaps in our thinking that he could have been there. So three things that John said, get ready, get right, get your life right, repent, turn, change your mind about the way you're living, and do the right thing. Get right with God. That was the message that John the Baptist had. Pastor Tim, I, I love the story of the, the man that uh, painted the church. He made a deal with the pastor to paint the church for $5,000. He took 20 gallons of paint thinner and mixed it with one gallon of paint. He painted the entire church, and it was beautiful. It was, oh, it was perfectly white and all of a sudden right when the pastor was ready to give the man the five thousand dollars a big cloud came right over the church and poured rain right down and washed all the paint off the church and out from the cloud came this thundering voice repaint and thin no more <laughs> that, that was the message of john repaint Repent, change your mind, turn from your sin and honor God with your life. They were confessing their sins, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing to confess sin, amen? It's okay. The Bible says we're to confess our faults one toward another. It's good that we get it right that we get ready and that we get right. And lastly, on this third point, John the Baptist was saying this, get real, get real. Think not to say within yourselves that we're the children of Abraham and that because we're related in some particular genealogy or family background that we have a right to the kingdom. And John was saying, no, don't say that because God is able of these stones to raise up Children of Abraham, don't say because you are of a certain brand or a certain denomination that you have a right to the kingdom of God. That is not true. You have the right to the kingdom of God when you're born again, and then you can enter into the kingdom of God. So God was telling those that were there, you don't have any official right, even though you are the children of Abraham. You must get real. Get ready. Get right. And get real, because the king is coming. That was the message that John the Baptist was preaching. I just elaborated on it a little bit. He preached and taught many things. He taught about the kingdom of heaven and to do the right thing and to give to the needy and take what you have and help the poor. He taught many, many wonderful things and we should do the same. You know, it was a wonderful day when I became a Christian and I accepted Christ as my Savior, that Jesus became my Savior, and I accepted him. I believe the message that he died for my sins, that he suffered for me, and that he was the just for the unjust, that he might bring me to God. And I accepted Christ when I was 12 years old and was baptized at the age of 12. But then I wandered from God, did my own thing, went my own way, and 
the greatest day of my life upon becoming a Christian and accepting Christ as my Savior was when I decided to make Jesus the king of my kingdom and make him the king of my life. Not just my Savior, but my king and my master and my Lord and my everything. That I would bring everything under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is a king. He was born king. He was Harold King, and he's coming back as king. That was a great day when I said, yes, I'm going to serve you, Lord Jesus. You're going to be the king of my life. And it's a great day in the life of every believer when we not only make Christ our savior, but our king. Have you made him the king of your life? The king of your, every decision you make the kingdom of your finance, the kingdom of your devotion? Have you been baptized? Are you part of a local New Testament church? Are you ready to give Jesus everything? These are important principles that he would become the king of your kingdom. I want to talk a little bit about the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. John baptized Jesus in Matthew 3 and verses 13 through 15. And you can look with me if you'd like. In verse number 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the river Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him and said, I am not worthy to be baptized by you. I need to be baptized by you. You're the coming, and you're coming to me? Then Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus would start officially his public ministry. The first thing he did, he went to John to be identified with humanity. Jesus didn't need to be baptized for his sins because he had no sin. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But yet Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist, the son of God. And Jesus tells John, John, Suffer to be, for it is given to us to fulfill all righteousness. By the way, this was the beginning, the ordination of Jesus' public ministry. Jesus basically lived in obscurity with his family, taking care of his mother. And now he would be baptized and the anointing of the Holy Spirit would officially anoint Jesus to start his public ministry. And from that time on, the next day, if you'll recall, the disciples were with John the Baptist and Jesus comes marching on the scene. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he tells the disciples, Follow him. Here's the Messiah. John said these great words. He must increase and I must decrease. And from that time, the disciples left John and they began to follow Jesus. It was on that exact day that they began to follow Jesus. Do you remember when you made the decision to follow Jesus? They do. They'll never forget that day. Jesus comes on the scene and 
they believed that he was the king and they followed him. Have you followed him? Will you follow him? Do you love him? Is he the king of your kingdom? The greatest day in the life of a Christian is when they not only accept Christ as their savior, but they make Jesus the king of their kingdom. I want to challenge you this week, Discovery, to make Jesus Christ the king of your life. And never look back. He's the greatest thing, the greatest one. He was born king. He lived as king. And he's coming back as king. I want to pray with you. And we're going to have a time of invitation for you to do what God would have you to do. And I encourage you, if you need to make a decision, there'll be people here to meet you in the front. The pastor is he always here. Make that decision. Put Christ first place in your life. Maybe you're here and you need to join the church or be baptized like Jesus was baptized. I encourage you to do that as well. Let me pray. We're going to have a time of invitation and you do what God would have you to do. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for our Savior who was born king. Who's coming back as king. And his kingdom, Lord, begins and starts within us. Father, I pray that you would open hearts. Do your great work in your church today, Lord. And if there's only one here, Father, that needs to make a decision for Christ, I pray that they would say yes to Jesus. Maybe you're watching online and you're listening to this message, I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus. Just thank him for coming and dying and making a way when there was no other way. Ask him to come into your life. He's faithful. And he's alive forevermore. We're so thankful that we serve a living God, a living Savior, a living Christ. Father, do your great work once again, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said.